All right. Okay, so let me continue. All right. So we went through the syllabus. I said that two other you know, major topics or three other major topics I guess I wanted to cover for today, right? So some basic calculus. So what are, what are the things that I expect that you know? So in, in, I don't even know exactly what, what they're fully teaching in calculus these days, but all the stuff on derivatives, the expectation is that you should know all the derivatives. I mean, I say know all the derivatives, right? I mean, so in, in electrical engineering, you're not, you know, it, it's pretty useless to know things like the, the arc cosine and the arc tangent and all that kind of stuff. I'm not, you're not gonna, you're not gonna see me give you derivatives of, of stuff like that. The stuff that matters, all right, the stuff that comes up a lot it is it really, you know, these, these first two functions here, the exponentials, e to the at, and integrals of sines and derivatives of sines and cosines. Everything that we think of, almost everything we think of in electrical and computer engineering is an exponential and or a sine or cosine. And we'll see that sines and cosines are also exponentials. All right, so, so these, these two things right here, that's the core of it all, all right, for us. All right, so let me ask you this. Let's see, I'm gonna throw this out there. Somebody should be able to answer this. You should know this, it should be in your head. If I said, what's the integral of e to the at? What is that? You said one over a e to the at? Yep, one over a e to the at plus a constant since that's, you know, that's not a big part, right? And if I say, what's the derivative d by dt of e to the at? What's that? A e to the at. A e to the at. All right, that should be like one plus one equals two in your mind, all right? If those, those memorize those, in other words, you should know sine, you should know cosine, you should know the exponentials, you should know those, and you should know the polynomials, all right? Those things should be cold in your, in your brain. I know that your TI 92, 89, whatever can, can do that for you. That's great for the, your calculator, right? Um, but, but these things should be, should be in your brain. They are as fundamental as one plus one, as far as I'm concerned. All right, you can, you can do those things online with Wolfram Alpha or your calculator or whatever, but you'll, you'll find that it'll kill you come exam time if you're relying on those kinds of tools. All right, these are the things that you will see in this class and in fields and waves and in signals and systems and systems two and all that stuff. So those are the ones you really wanna, you wanna get to know. Um, I expect that you have integration by parts. Hopefully you guys remember what that is. Like when I have something like exponential and sine together, all right? Um, and you should have taken uh, ordinary differential equations, ODEs, right? So you should have some familiarity with those. We will cover differential equations in here. Um, that, that'll be one of the topics that we will cover. Um, you can review that in the syllabus, um, but, but ODEs, I expect that you've taken a differential equations class, okay? Um, <clears throat> I don't, again, that's about the limits of the calculus. I don't expect that you guys are, are remembering, you know, what's the integral of, uh, cinch and cosh and all that stuff. The, the, the things that really matter to me are these two, all right? Because they matter a lot for what we do, okay? The other thing that you'll see is oftentimes in calculus, you, you usually things, things are a function of X, right? Often, typically you're gonna see our stuff be a function of time, okay? Um, anybody know why that might be that we think of functions of time? Any ideas? How something changes with time? Yeah, and so like what kind of thing would we be looking at? We talk about electrical engineering or computer engineering, right? We're talking about a voltage or a current or, or something like that, right? Those are things that change over time, right? They're not function, a voltage isn't really a function of position, right? A, a voltage is a function of time, right? And so oftentimes we're talking about our functions as functions of time. So you'll see me having T very often, much more so than X, okay? Now, Big question is why so much math, okay? So what I wanna do is I'm gonna to go to one of my other browsers, I guess. Uh, not that one, the one with fewer tabs here. All right. And 
I'm going to play a little video. So what this is, some of you guys may have seen this sort of thing before. This is this was something that was at Discovery Place a couple of years ago. Um, but basically, what I've got is a is a robot that solves a Rubik's cube here. All right, so um, let me let it play. I don't need its full video, but okay. So basically, inside this guy, all right. So he shows off his little Rubik's cube thing. Eventually, he's going to put it in that holder. And then he's going to start to solve it. So notice when he solves it, that guy's making a lot of very precise turns. Like if you look at what he's doing right there, I mean, let's, let's just watch that, right? So there's a 90 degree turn. There's a 90 degree turn. There's another 90 degree turn, right? So, you know, there's, there's some other stuff going on here. There's, there's some AI that's probably involved in this thing as well, but I think about just the robot part right here, right? Nowadays, you can get an Arduino kit, Raspberry Pi kit, whatever, and you, you can tinker and you can design all kinds of robot stuff, right? But there's a difference between an engineer and a tinkerer. And the engineer is somebody who can really think through, how do I design the system? And to do that right, I already, I already said this before, but to, to design a system, I need a model, right? Models are the things that we need to be able to design systems. All right, so in this particular example, all right, I'll ask you guys here. So what are the components that have to be, to, to make this robot arm function, right? What are the things that have to be involved in that robot arm? What must be involved? Like all these 90 degree turns like that this guy is making right here, right? What has to be involved in this thing? Like what components are in this system? Need motors, like servos. Yep, I need motors, right? I need motors of some kind. And I need what else probably for those motors? Circuits that control the motors. Yeah, I need some kind of circuitry to control it, uh, which, which is gonna involve microcontrollers, right? It's gonna involve sensors, right? So one of the key things here, you know, so this guy in particular to make this Rubik's cube thing work, right? The point that I keep making, this guy has to make a 90 degree turn. He can't make, an, he can't make a, a 100 degree turn, right? Or an 80 degree turn, right? It's, you're gonna goof up the Rubik's cube if you can't make a 90 degree turn, right? So I need a model that's gonna allow me to be able to do that, right? To make that, to make that you know, turn work. So I wanna think about how I would set up that type of a system. So let me go back to my, my note sheet here. All right, so in that system, I'm gonna need Again, some kind of a microcontroller, right? So you guys know, again, as sort of a classic tinkerer, right? If I, if I go into, you know, a lot of classic web websites, these are tools that some of you guys have probably messed with a little bit, right? So, I, and so this is from Adafruit, right? So Arduino, all right, is a pretty common microcontroller. Some of you guys might've used um, the, you know, they have motor shields and different things that plug into it. I basically just did a little search for, okay, if I wanted to build a robot, what would be the things I would need, right? And I, I, there's a little kit you can get at Adafruit that'll tell you some of the stuff that you need. So if I want to design this thing, so that's, this is the key thing. So that robot made a 90 degree turn. So inside there, there is a motor of some kind. All right, so a motor would look like a, a, a cylinder and then it would have a shaft on it, which would be sticking out. In other words, I need to make this thing make a turn of 90 degrees. So to do that precisely, what I have to do is I have to apply an appropriate voltage to this thing and get, this, get the angle to be controlled, okay? So I apply a voltage and it controls the angle of a shaft. So in that, in that video, right, you turn it 90 degrees, okay? That was, my, that was my outcome. My outcome was to control an angle. My input was to control a voltage. So the way I think about this and, and the way that we'll, we'll think about everything is we develop some kind of a model and we, we try to draw this picture here. I have some set of inputs on this side and I have some set of outputs on this side, okay? So inputs could be like, for instance, the, the voltage that I apply at, at the terminals of a motor, right? So in a motor, it's an it's electromechanical system. I put a voltage and a current at the input and I get an angle at the output. And inside here, I need some sort of a model, right? That relates the inputs to the outputs, right? So basically something that tells me how the output 
is a function of the input. Somehow I need to get that relationship developed. And what you find often is that people don't understand how to make that relationship, right? So, so when, I'm, when I'm talking about this, right? So, so in my example, you know, let's say for my motor, this is a voltage, voltage. And this over here is a position, an angle. Okay. What, what kind of stuff would be, you know, what are the things that I'm modeling physically? I think about that picture, right? Where I'm trying to control that Rubik's cube. What are some of the things that would be, that would have to be captured by that model, right? So it's capturing the physics of that situation, but what are the physics that are involved there? What, what, what do you think I need to model? Some form of circuitry that can read difference between high and low voltage and then take positions to correspond to that. Yeah, so what you talked about basically is, is a sensor. I need some way of, of having a sensor and modeling the behavior of that sensor, right? A sensor that can measure the position, right? And tell me how to apply a voltage to this thing. But I also need a model for the motor, right? So right here, what I, what I took is, this is a weird looking thing for, for some of you guys probably, right? But what I have here is a, an electrical circuit model for a motor, okay? And I'm not gonna go through and derive it. It's outside of the scope of this class. This is something what, like what we'll work with on the project though. On the projects later on in the semester, we're gonna, you're basically gonna be designing, let's say a control system for a motor, all right? And so you'll have, I'll give you the physics and, and you have to go through in MATLAB and have to, to sort of do the design work with that model to do something, okay? Um, so this guy is, is how I would begin to understand how a motor works. They said, you can go to Adafruit or whatever, you know, your favorite website is and get an Arduino kit and design a robot. But the question is, if I, if I need that robot to do something very specific, I need to be able to figure out how is, you know, what's the voltage I need to apply to make this happen. Okay. So in this case, if I were to say, well, what's the, the model of this thing? I, I need to figure that out. Basically, it tells me looking at this picture, inside of a motor, there's resistance and inductance. So you guys should know what inductance is. 2111 is a prerequisite for this course. <clears throat> You're going to say you don't, you don't remember much about it, right? I know that's the case, but VA of T is my input to this thing. My output would be the speed of this guy. And usually I write speed as omega like that, okay? So how would I, how would I go ahead and how would I approach getting a, a relationship VA to IA, that current right there? How would, I, how would I develop a relationship for this circuit? Could you use Ohm's law and say that voltage equals current times resistance? Yeah, so if I want to get, yeah, so voltage across this resistor, right, would be IA times that resistance. If I wanted to figure out how VA relates to the whole circuit, right, I'd have to do a full KVL, and Ohm's law would be part of that, right, but it would be a full KVL, so I'd say IA times RA. Then what's the voltage across an inductor? Who remembers that? Uh, LDI over DT. Yep, LDI by DT. And then, you know, there's this other voltage source in here, which is related to the speed of the motor. All right, this isn't a class about motors, so I'm not going to get into that. But basically what I'm saying is this, this is a mechanical thing over here, the speed of it. This is an electrical thing that I put in. Somehow I need to find a way to relate those things. And differential equations are needed to, to do that. Now, one thing we're going to talk about later on, I mean, differential equations, all right? I know a lot of practicing engineers. And some of you will say, well, you know, I talked to my dad or my mom or my uncle or whatever, who's an engineer. And he said, I never needed to, I've never used differential equations. It's probably correct. Uh, many practicing engineers don't really solve differential equations or do calculus on a regular basis, right? But the principles are important, right? If I have a, if I have a, a, a differential equation, what does that mean? What's the physical meaning of having a differential equation? We're gonna talk about this a lot more later in the semester, but I wanna see if anybody knows. 
What does it mean when I have a differential equation? Showing how the model changes over time. Showing how, well, and so something really key that you just said, I, differential equations model systems that change over time, okay? If I, if I told you, okay, in 2111, you basically dealt with what I would call stupid circuits, right? They're, they're basically resistors and voltage sources and current sources, stuff like that. Is this a dynamic system right here? So I got a voltage source, could be a battery, and I got three resistors hooked up in series to it. Is that a dynamic system? Uh, the voltage is staying constant, so I would say no, it's not dynamic. It's yeah, at, at time t equal to zero, I, I, turn the, I turn the switch on and electrons start moving in that circuit. And that's it. It's static. It never changes after that. Okay. But if I, if I modify that guy and say, well, you know what, I'm going to put a capacitor in here as well. Now that becomes a dynamic circuit, right? If I look at the voltage across the capacitor and let's see if you guys know this, if I looked at the voltage across that capacitor and just to make you feel happy, I'll, I'll draw a little switch in here too. All right. And at T equal to zero, I'll close that switch. Right. What would the voltage across that capacitor look like? There's a whole, you know, there's a differential equation to solve to, to do all that stuff, right? But what, what would it look like if I said versus time? If I went to an oscilloscope and measured the voltage on the capacitor over time, what would it look like? Over time, it would reach the source voltage. It would. It's it, depending on what it started at. If it was initially at zero, it would, it would eventually reach up. And, and again, there's an exponential that defines that. Basically what that says is, is that that's a dynamic system, right? That system doesn't immediately get to its steady state. It takes time to get to its steady state. And the fact that it takes time to get to its steady state, that's the stuff that we need to model, right? We need, we need good models for that stuff if we want to design good engineered systems. Now, does it matter? Do I need to you know, guess what the homogeneous solution is and stuff like that? We're going to talk about all that stuff later, but do, you know, is it important that I know all that stuff? In my mind, it isn't, all right? What's important probably is that I remember that this thing is, you know, an exponential, right? And, and that it's always gonna be an exponential, right? And I wanna understand what are the physical things that, that for, to force it to respond as quickly or as slowly as it does, okay? So we'll talk about that, but one of the key things I wanted to, to kind of get at is that, you know, we're gonna talk a lot about dynamic systems and how we deal with dynamic systems in this class. And that means that we're, we're gonna talk about differential equations. And unfortunately, because this is a math class, we are gonna to have to talk about how to, how to solve those things. All right, now, one of, the, one of the big things here, right? Like if I, if I talk about this, there's, there's more to my model too. I, you know, I, I could talk about making all sorts of models for the mechanical system, right? Um, and I'm not, we're gonna, you, you'll see this in one of your projects, right? There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff from physics about moments of inertia and stuff like that and torques that, that you can develop models for. And it's important for us, if I wanna build a system like what I was showing in that video to figure out how I get from a voltage and, and get myself into a speed or an angle of a shaft, right? And in this case, I was saying, well, I could have something like a gearbox or something if I had a servo machine. So again, all that stuff needs to be thought about. And then typically, if I really want to make this thing, usually what I end up doing is I build a system that looks like this. And when I say when I build a model, right, what I typically do is I, is I ultimately get to a picture like this one, okay? Where, where what I have is, okay, I've got a motor here. That motor is turning a load, right? That load is basically the weight, all right, of that arm that has to spin in my example. And what I have here is, is, is the way this thing would kind of be put together, right? So in the real world out here, I'd have some sort of power supply, all right? Some sort of a circuit that would apply voltages to the motor, but where does that circuit, so this is my, this is my, this is, this guy here is a circuit, all right? And the output of that circuit drives a motor. Where does the input come from for that circuit? Well, what I'm showing here is usually it comes from inside a computer, right? If I talk about a real system, an embedded system, typically what I have is, is there is some computer that's the brains that basically gives some signals over to some kind of a circuit that drives some kind of a load. 
And then there's some kind of a sensor that measures something and sends it back into the computer. And then what I end up doing is I end up making some kind of a mathematical model that says, okay, from the voltage in to the speed out, I get this kind of a model right here. Now this guy is in terms of a variable S. Let me ask you guys this, you're taking differential equations. When do you see the variable S? Laplace transformations. Laplace, Laplace transformations. Yeah, this is a Laplace transform, all right? And Laplace transforms are really useful for us to design with, right? So we're going to talk about, about some of that and how we use it, um, you know, in the real world for, for applications. Um, this class is all about, about theory, and, and we're, going to, we're going to keep the, the discussion on theory. But for me, as an engineer, I can't get too far away from the reality before I start getting angry, right? If I'm, if I'm just doing math, I get angry, right? I need, it needs to be that math has a purpose. Um, and the purpose of the math is for me to take a, take a problem like this one, where I want to make a robot work and think about how I use the math to make the model that helps me make the system. All right. <clears throat> now, in this, in this case here, right, we're not going to, we're not going to spend a lot of time modeling stuff. Unfortunately, that probably would be a more interesting topic for a lot of you guys to think about how to do that, but we, we're going to empower ourselves with the right tools and hopefully the right process of thinking about this thing. Now, what about if some of you guys hopefully have, have messed with this kind of thing before? This, when I say inside a computer, this would be something like an Arduino if you've used that kind of thing before. Hopefully some of you have, right? Well, if I was driving a motor, this, I said this was my circuit here, this guy that's written this power converter. Anybody know what kind of circuit do we typically use to drive a motor? Anybody who's done it? I mean, there's a special name for the circuits that are typically used in embedded systems. Is it an H bridge? Yeah, an H bridge. All right, so it's a, it's a circuit that looks like, like this, where I have the motor sort of connected to between four switches. All right, that's what these things are, switches. All right, what they really are, are transistors. A transistor is just a switch. It's either on or it's off just like a light switch, okay? And typically what the voltage across a motor looks like is this, all right? Now we're gonna do this a lot. Basically what I'm showing is I'm showing the voltage across the motor as a function of time, all right? And so I've labeled this as VDC. Let's, let's just say, let's put numbers here. Let's say this is 12 volts here. So what this is saying is that there's a voltage across the motor for a time dt, and then it's zero volts for a time t, and then it's 12 volts again, and then it's zero volts again, and it repeats. What kind of wave is this? Anybody know? What's the square name? wave. Square, square wave. wave. Yeah, it's a square wave, right? And <clears throat> now this thing is a DC motor. All right. Now you guys should know enough about circuits. What's DC mean? Direct current. Direct current. What, what's, so what's a DC voltage look like? Straight wow. line. Straight line. It's a constant as a function of time. That's not what this is. In other words, I'm driving a DC motor with something that's not constant. Okay. In other words, this guy is 12, 0, 12, 0, 12, 0. That's not constant. Right? Why would I do that? Is it to control this motor? Because it's what? Speed control. Yeah, but I mean, it's a DC motor. I, if I gave it six volts, it would go one speed. If I gave it 12 volts, it would go faster. If I gave it 18 volts, it would go even faster than that, right? Why can not just do it that way? Computer chip though? What's that? Can you do that with a computer though? Sure, you could make a, you could get a D to A converter. That would work, right? It's much easier to do what I've just shown right here, to, do, to, to use this approach. A computer could do it, but this is much easier, much easier, much cheaper to create this square wave. Somehow, some way, if I look at the motor, this, this kind of tells me something funny, right? If I, if I apply 12 volts, then zero, 12, then zero, 12, then zero, if you did that really slow, what would the motor look like? Well, it would go fast and then it would stop. Go fast and then it would stop go fast and then it would stop. So in reality, what I'm doing is I'm driving the motor really fast. If I look at a motor, do you see it do that? Do you see it stop, start, stop, start, stop, start if you've ever done it this way? You don't. 
it moves constantly. Even though I'm basically applying a voltage and then not, applying a voltage and then not, somebody knew enough about the model of this motor to know that this approach would be the same thing as applying a constant voltage, all right? There had to be a mathematical model to think about how that would happen. The approach here is something called pulse width modulation, all right? And what we find is that the motor only responds to the average value of this waveform, okay? What's, how, let me ask you this. If I had a waveform as a function of time like this and I asked you to find its average, anybody know how to do that? What would be the math function to find the average of this thing? Anybody remember from calculus? Did you integrate it over time? Yeah, I'd integrate over one period, right? And so I'd do one over T times the integral over one period, all right? Which gets me to the thing I'm gonna talk about a little bit here for the last 10 minutes. Right, this is an average. All right now, I don't expect that you necessarily remember that. All right, you should have seen it somewhere, so you hopefully you remember it. But anyway, that's um, we're gonna, this. This is the whole point of a course like this, right? Is we need a whole set of mathematical tools to think about waveforms like this one to be able to understand how to develop systems that we want in the real world. All right, and that's going to be our focus and our approach. Now. <clears throat> One really important class of waveforms, like even this guy right here, this square wave, this square wave is actually a bunch of sine waves added together, all right? Sine waves have a really special place. And when I say sine waves, I'm talking about things that are a function of time, okay? Sine waves have a really important role in ECE problems, right? Because any kind of, any kind of, any things that are circuits process, right? And when I say circuits, I'm keeping that general, right? Even when I'm talking about digital circuits, right? If I'm talking about computer engineering problems, any real signals that we process for the most part are sinusoids, right? So I'm talking about audio signals. So when you have voltages, you guys have, you know, in circuits, you have all kinds of wacky circuits that have resistor loops here and there and capacitors and all that sort of stuff. The voltage sources that you would have in many cases, you know, in the real world, those voltage sources would be generators, right? That produce sinusoidal voltages, okay? That's why right now you're taking 2112, most of you, right? And 2112 is all about AC waveforms. It's really gonna be all about the study of sine waves because real world signals like audio, so in other words, music and voice, right? Those create sinusoidal waves. Power waveforms are sinusoidal. Radio signals are sinusoidal. Right, And those sinusoidal signals usually need to come into a computer. They need to be digitized and turned into some sort of a sinusoidal, um, a digital sinusoid, okay? So because of all these critical real world applications, there's probably more, but audio, power, and radio, you know, really kind of capture um, the majority of things that I can think of. Um, all of those things, because they're sinusoidal, we spend a lot of time thinking about sine waves and we have a lot of special tools and procedures for trying to deal with those, okay? So I'm going to talk a lot about the sine function, all right? So, and we talk, talk about this, so sine and cosine, sine of theta, and you guys may not like this at first, but I, I tend to use, I talk about sinusoidal things, but I oftentimes when I say sinusoids, I'm, I, I use it interchangeably for sine and cosine, all right? Um, the important thing about a sine function, which one have I drawn here? Is this sine or cosine that I've drawn? I think sine, right? No, that's, that's, that's the question to you. It's, uh, yeah, sine. Sine goes up first. Sin, yeah, sine, sine is the one that's starting out crossing through zero, right? So what I've written here is, is a couple of things. So X of T is what I've called this, all right? And sine is defined to be a function of angle and it's defined in radians. The definition of sine is in radians. So I go through one period um, in two pi radians, okay? Or 360 degrees. Um, what's this value, what's the peak? If I, take, if I say sine of theta, what's its peak value? What's it always between? One, one and negative, negative one. one. Yeah, one and negative one, right? Now, <clears throat> if I have a, if, if I, this guy here has an amplitude, right, X sub M, 
In other words, the peak value of this guy is X sub M. This guy is going to be between X sub M and negative X sub M, all right? Now, um, this guy is, so in general, you know, I say these things are a function of angle, right? If I'm talking about something that is a, is a sine wave, then usually what I have is I say it's a function of time. And I say that the angle changes at some rate, omega times T. So omega has what units here? If this is radians, right, the angle, what, what units does omega have? Yeah, radians per second. Okay. Now, in general, no real engineer usually uses radians per second, right? They usually use what other measure? Anybody know? Hertz. Hertz, right? Which is units of one over seconds, okay? So, <clears throat> you know, made a couple of, I made two, two definitions here already, right? So when it comes to a sine wave, I've got two key, there's three key things usually. The amplitude, the frequency and something called a phase shift, okay? So this particular case, what I have is um, my angular frequency has units of radians per second. My amplitude is, is X sub M, all right? But again, engineers don't typically use omega, uh, the, the angular frequency it's called, right? Here's my definitions. Omega is the angular frequency, right? XM is the amplitude. What we say is omega is equal to two pi F, all right? So omega is how fast I go through one period in time, all right? And then I make one other definition here. So um, how long it takes for this guy to repeat, right? Sine waves are, are functions that are repeating. They're periodic, right? So the definition, we, we use this term called a period, right? What we say is if I look at the value of a function at time little t, if I skip ahead by a time big T, that's what we call the period. The function is the same at that point, okay? And the period is related to the frequency by one over F, okay? How quickly it repeats. Now, in general, when engineers talk about stuff, they usually talk about what is the amplitude of something and what is its frequency in Hertz. And we can relate period and angular frequency to the, the frequency in Hertz uh, on a pretty regular basis, right? So, so we, can, we can relate those things. Now, what that, what that means is, right, if I'm looking at a real sine wave, what I see for a real sine wave is, what I've shown here is this, is, this is a situation where this guy is in angle. A real sine wave, I'm always gonna show my x-axis as a function of time, okay? So this is time zero. This is one period. This is T equal to capital T. When I reach here, right, it's a quarter of the period. Here's half the period. Here's three quarters of the period, right? Pretty straightforward stuff. A lot of this you should have seen before, right? Now, <clears throat> in reality, sometimes we have what we call a phase shift, all right? Meaning that if I take something like a, like a sine wave and I shift it to the left or right, so it's not a sine, but it's, in other words, it's, it's maybe shifted just a little bit away from where it's supposed to be. That's what I call a phase shift, all right? We're gonna, I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail on Wednesday when I have more time. But let's say I, let's say I have this, this waveform or this signal right here, this general form, all right? And I've, I've basically said it has an amplitude of 10 volts, a period of 0.1. So which means that, so if a period is 0 0.1 seconds, then F is one over the period is 10 Hertz, okay? And I say this guy has a 45 degree phase shift, okay? What we're going to do, we're going to talk about this in a lot more detail on Wednesday. We're going to spend a while on this, looking at this at the beginning of class. But what I have here is a set of commands that allow me to plot this thing in MATLAB. Now, <clears throat> notice, notice. Let, let, me, let me talk about this guy here for one minute in what I've got left. All right. MATLAB has a set of built-in functions. All right. One of the built-in functions it has is cosine. Okay. So what I did was I took 10, which is my amplitude. 
times. So the times in MATLAB is, is the asterisk, okay? And notice what I did. I have cosine of two times pi times one over t. And then I have times t plus pi over four, all right? So this looks exactly like this expression where I've said that f is one over t, all right? The frequency is one over t, all right? <clears throat> now, what I've done here, and this is what I'm gonna talk about on, on Wednesday, right? Is I've got a set of commands that are gonna generate a plot of this thing. They're gonna generate the plot that I have right here, okay? Now, what, I, what have I done? Anybody who knows MATLAB, what is this T equals square brackets, zero colon T over 1000 to colon two times T? Anybody know what that is? If you don't, that's okay. We're gonna talk about that more Wednesday. Anybody know? Is it an array? It's an array. Yeah. What I'm doing is I'm saying I want to create a, an array of values that begin at zero and end at two times t. In other words, they span two periods. And I want to generate values spaced by t over a thousand. So in other words, this guy would have values from zero and then he would have at 0 0.1 divided by a thousand. And then he would have zero point, um, yeah, 0 0.2 divided by a thousand. And then he would have 0 0.3 divided by a thousand. And that would go all the way up to two times 0 0.1, like that. And what I'm telling MATLAB is I want you to draw for me the, that waveform at these points in time, okay? Now your TI calculator basically figures out what times to do it, right? In this case, in MATLAB, the tricky thing is you have to tell it the times to do that, okay? That's where we're going to spend our time talking about on Wednesday, because this is one of the most important things that we have to do is to figure out how to learn how to use this basic tool. All right. <clears throat> your, the first part of your homework really touches on just some basic stuff like calculus. I'm not going to review calculus, right? That's you guys should know the basics of calculus. You, sh you can start right into your homework. The last two problems on the homework get into the, the last one gets into some MATLAB. All right. And the second to last one just gets into identifying things like what's the frequency, what's the, what's the amplitude, stuff like that, okay? All right, <clears throat> we have a lot more to say about this. We're gonna continue with this exact example. We're gonna talk about this, about this tool, about, about this process on Wednesday. All right, so I'm gonna stop my